Um, to begin, I want to thank Jonathan, Beck, and fellow members of the UK Star Trek Society for this opportunity. It's an honour for me to present alongside my fellow speakers and to Professor Gordon, whose research into Africana philosophy and Franz Fanon has greatly inspired my approach. Um, I want to make an announcement at the start. First of all, this is my first ever academic presentation. <laughs> so, any constructive... Oh, yeah. Yeah, any constructive feedback afterwards is appreciated. And any Derrida scholars, any deconstructive feedback is also appreciated. Um, I want to say that this analysis focuses on a Durkheimian interpretation of suicide and follows the notion of a nomic suicidal act whereby the individual kills themselves because of dissatisfaction or disgust with their own existence. To investigate altruistic, honor-based suicide, such as the act of suicide bombing or self-immolation, requires a different scope of inquiry, and the same can be said for egoistic or stress-induced suicide. Any reference made to the word suicide in this presentation should be referred to as anomic suicide. I would also like to state that although my approach is an academic one, it stems from personal beliefs and investigations into suicidality. Suicidality is a lived reality for many people with many intersectional characteristics, and my, my approach would not have been possible without the love and help of my family, friends and loved ones, as well as the constant support of staff members by Warwick Law School and Warwick Sociology and the unparalleled work of staff at Warwick Counselling Services, the Stuart Crescent Health Centre, and the Samaritans. Suicide has been referred to as one of the most challenging problems to philosophy. On a concept conceptual level, it is intrinsically linked to notions of freedom and liberty. The common notion is the view that suicide, in making death a certainty, destroys the inherent freedoms and liberties of the individual. The individual is no longer able to make choices and can neither act nor think in whatever way they desire. In imposing the ultimate limitation on themselves, they have committed a morally reprehensible act in violation of their own humanity. Jean-Paul Sartre found the idea of suicide to be an act of bad faith. He states that to be dead is to be a prey for the living. For Sartre, Committing suicide and giving up all agency and capacity to contribute to the ideal world negates the innate, pers innate purpose of humanity, which is to attribute mu meaning to life. In committing suicide, the individual will become an artifact, a finite object which is subject to investigation by other individuals. This line of thought emphasizes self-control over destiny. You are at liberty to act in the way you choose and you are free to observe your own choices. However, in removing this agency, the act of suicide becomes absurd for Sartre. Similarly, Kant describes suicide as an attempt to withdraw from all obligation, contradicting principles of human autonomy and the capacity of the individual to be self-determined. Hegel declares that no, no one can stand above and execute himself. Executing yourself not only means that, one, you deliberately relinquish your autonomy, and become an object, but also that you dispute natural law and the cognizant rule of death as a universal human evil. John Stuart Mill corroborates stating that the principle of freedom cannot require that one should be free not to be free. Maurice Blanchot decrees that suicide is a leap from the certainty of the planned act of suicide to the crumbling of the inert and the obscurity of the non-true. For these highly respected thinkers and several others, death cannot be made and should not be made an object of the will. Following this line of thought, suicide can never be justifiable. It eliminates consciousness and agency which give value and meaning to human freedom and liberty. In these perspectives, consciousness and agency are crucial to being human. It appears that the main question of inquiry in the aforementioned approaches to suicide is obviously why. But here I want to induce, introduce two whys. One, in terms of why kill yourself. And two, why did this individual kill themselves? The individual is investigated in the previous approaches as a uniform concept. They are human and that is it. 
There is no external influence, and suicide is personal and purely internal. It is a matter of two binary opposites of life and death, and a complete autonomous choice between the two. But I seek to challenge this by posing the alternative question of why did this individual kill themselves? The first question is inherently limited. It focuses on human capacity to make choices, but neglects to consider that for certain individuals, the freedom and liberty which allows them to make certain choices is limited by others. God, that's, that's awful. Um, the, for the previous question of inquiry, suicide is problematic because it quashes the ability to make choices through the individual choosing death. But to truly understand the suicidal frame of mind, you must realise that to feel suicidal means that there is a problem with your existence. The limitation of the previous approaches is to presume that the core decision between life and death is what renders suicide the problematic. The real problem is the individual's concept and truth of their existence. For one to decree suicide to be a problem and unjust unjustifiable, one must know what it is to feel as if you are a problem. You must be able to feel as if your freedoms and liberties are limited or non-existent, and that something about you is a problem for others and or for yourself. This is what W.E.B. Du Bois sought to achieve by posing the question to white hegemony, how does it feel to be a problem? In doing so, he exposed the situation that the typical white citizen living in the early 20th century, and even often now, cannot fully comprehend the idea of being deprived of the normative humanity which the aforementioned philosophers were focused on defending. Du Bois's question externalises Eurocentric thought and focuses the questions on the victim of racism and colonialism. He signifies the difference between the dominated and the dominator, where the dominator cannot, can never truly answer the question of being a problem, as the state, their status as human or the societal norm has never been challenged. To give further examples, why would the suicidal act of a prisoner be unjust when they are not treated as a fully-fledged citizen of their legal domain? Or the suicide of a shamed samurai committing seppuku? Why, when they have been ostracised from their community and value system, should they not commit suicide? What about the suicide of a police officer following Hurricane Katrina, who believed he was unable to stop the murder, rape and pillage and mayhem following the new disaster in New Orleans? Was he destroying his own humanity, or was he not tra trying to salvage any humanity left in his city? These examples view, suicide, view themselves as problems for not only themselves, but their surroundings, and further to this, their surroundings view themselves as a problem. The previous phenomenological question of why kill yourself is therefore limited because it suggests that suicide is a fixed situation and that every iteration or moment of suicidal thought is inherently unjust. The reality is that suicide cannot be fully analysed without an account of the individual's external context. This must include the individual's life, their value system and their social, cultural, economic and political status. Thus, for certain individuals or communities, suicide should not even require the question of justification. It is pointless to toe the, toe the line of established Eurocentric thought on suicide when it concerns an individual for whom their freedoms and liberties are rendered limited or non-existent. This is the particular reason why I analyse suicide in the context of colonialism and the colonial methods of systematic violence, political repression, sexual debilitation, debilitation and socio-cultural hegemony. These methodologies serve to create an environment of total domination over the colonised peoples. The colonised people were not regarded by the dominator population as human. Importing forward this view, I draw upon the thematic density of a towering work of post-colonial African fiction. Chenua Achebe's Things Fall Apart channels these stories Achebe was told by family elders and his village of tribal life before white Christian settlers arrived. In using Yeats's The Second Coming as the epigraph for the haunting novel ahead, he forewarns of the enduring effects of the widening gyre of colonialism and the irreconcilable falling apart of society in the colonies. 
having been born into the colonial environment and brought up in circumstances whereby his native Igbo Nigerian culture was repressed. Achebe sought to detail the truth of, a, of Igbo culture. He sought to move away from what Wale Soyinka descri- describes as the manipulated exoticism put forward by the European literary canon. The protagonist Okonkwo, in Achebe's words, is one of the greatest men of his time, being a proud warrior, a revered leader and respected father figure within the tribe. As his world is upended by white Christian colonial conquests, the ambitions and value systems which once affixed status, superiority and at the very least humanity upon him were replaced with a colonial framework of domination which threatened his existence. The idea of assimilating an alien culture which treated him as subhuman was so incomprehensible to Okonkwo that he refused to uphold such a system. To him, the only way out was to end his own life. I'm now going to read a section from the the very end of the story. Obiarika, who had been gazing steadily at his friend's dangling body, turned suddenly to the district commissioner and said ferociously, That man was one of the greatest men in Mufia. You drove him to kill himself and now he will be buried like a dog. He could not say any more. His voice trembled and choked his words. Shut up, shouted one of the messengers quite unnecessarily. Take down the body, the commissioner ordered his chief messenger, and bring it and all these people to the court. Yes, sir, the messenger said, saluting. The commissioner went away, taking three or four of the soldiers with him. In the many years in which he had toiled to bring civilization to different parts of Africa, he had learnt a number of things. One of them was that a district commissioner must never attend to such undignified details, such as cutting down a hanged man from the tree. Such attention would give the natives a poor opinion of him. In the book which he planned to write, he thought he would stress that point. As he walked back to the court, he thought about that book. Every day brought him some new material. The story of this man who had killed a messenger and hanged himself would make interesting reading. One could almost write a whole chapter on him. Perhaps not a whole chapter, but a reasonable paragraph at any rate. There was so much else to include, and one must be firm in cutting out details. He had already chosen the title of the book after much thought. The Pacification of the Primitive Tribes of the Lower Niger. In escaping into the void of death, would Okonkwo be acting irrationally? If we are to follow established Eurocentric thought on the matter, Okonkwo's suicidal act would be the point at which he has destroyed the sanctity of his life and violated his own freedom and liberty. But how can this be compatible with the true nature of colonialism? The colonial system itself destroyed the freedom and liberty of millions. Yet how can existential thought maintain that an individual such as Okonkwo, in such a critical state, is only eliminating their agency and consciousness through the suicidal act. Surely colonialism has already placed them within an environment where they are denied the freedom and liberty that suicide would have denied. We see the complete negation of Okonkwo's life in the final statement where Achebe details that if the white district commissioner were to ever write a tale on Okonkwo, it would almost only be a whole chapter and barely a paragraph. To go further, the commissioner states that Okonkwo would be reduced to a man who had killed a messenger and hanged himself, and not the great and revered leader he was before. To go even further, the book itself would still refuse agency to the colonised population, being titled The Pacification of the Primitive Tribes. Achebe here shows the mystification and manipulation of the true pre-colonial society, as the district commissioner conveys the Igbo people as a primitive, violent, and savage community. To further expand upon this conception of the colonial regime, I've drawn upon the notions put forward by one of the most foremost post-colonial intellectuals. By way of a quick introduction to Franz Fanon's background for members of the audience who may be unfamiliar, Franz Fanon was born in Martinique in 1925 Through his military service with the Free French Forces, he became exposed to the horrors of the systematically racist colonial regime, bearing witness to the abuse of the Martinican people by the French naval forces and the expulsion of all soldiers of colour from his regiment. 
Following his expulsion, Fanon returned to Martinique, where he worked under Aimé Césaire during the parliamentary campaign, and later moved on to study medicine and psychiatry at Lyon. It was here that he wrote his first book, entitled Peur Noir, Masque Blanc, Black Skin, White Masks. In it, he analyzes the psychology of colonialism, specifically through the progressive self-alienation and identity crises of the colonized person. He is notable for reinforcing the notion of other race theorists that race is a social construct, imposed by the white settler population to maintain difference and division on grounds of ethnicity and cultural variation. To take Stuart Hall's term, race is a signifier, in the sense that it was perpetuated by white colonizers to maintain superiority and total domination through situating whiteness and Western values as the norm, the benchmark to which all other populations will be, will be measured. It was constructed to signify difference and to perpetuate exclusionary tactics, including segregation, colonialism and apartheid. It is for this reason that Fanon is determined to expose the truth of colonialism, that the colonized person is made into the white man's artifact merely due to whiteness becoming the norm. For this reason, the colonized person is subjugated and repressed. The white settler race expresses indifference, indifference toward their automatic manner of classifying, imprisoning, decivilizing, and primitivizing them purely on the basis of race. For many theorists on colonialism and race theory at large, these politics of difference and recognition are referred to in the context of self and other dialectics, whereby the self is the norm and the other is something which inherently challenges the self simply by their existence. The constant reference and self-reference of it as being the other is intended to maintain exclusion and the status quo of the self, keeping the other's challenge at bay. In critical race theory, the self would therefore be whiteness and the other would take the shape of any alternate community of colour. This is an approach taken by theorists such as Du Bois and Homi K. Baba, with the, with the latter describing the idea of the colonised other in opposition to the colonialist self. However, Fanon explains that the use of traditional self-other dialectics presupposes the existence of an ethical relationship. It affords ethical rights and bodily integrity to the other purely in the idea that the other is a challenge to the self. The self can only be challenged with some, by something which it views to be of the same or a similar standard. However, what colonialism perpetuated was systemic violence, unmitigated sexual exploitation, and various other dehumanizing treatments against indigenous populations. In this sense, the colonized people were never truly perceived as a challenge to the total domination of the colonizer. For Fanon, the colonized person lives in a zone of non-being. The zone of non-being for Fanon is a situation wherein the colonized loses capacity to resist the domination because they experience they experience because they are rendered devoid of humanity, devoid of cultural value, and devoid of ethical recognition by the hegemonic power of the colonizer. He describes that not only must the black man be black, he must be black in relation to the white man. The black man has no ontological resistance in the eyes of the white man. His customs and the sources on which they were based were wiped out because they were in conflict with a civilization that he did not know and that imposed itself upon him. The colonized lives in the zone of non-being because the colonized is not only refused their capacity to resist, their capacity to be afforded ethical value and recognition, and their capacity to be treated with integrity, but the colonizer also reduces any po potential for contribution to society by the colonized to zero. They are immediately discredited and negated. By way of further parallels regarding what Fanon sought to show by, by the zone of non-being, the concept mirrors certain aspects of Michel Foucault's theory of biopolitics and Giorgio Agamben's state of exception. The zone of non-being is brought about by colonialism's desire to control and maintain homeostatic power dynamics between the population that is available for exploitation and the population with the power to exploit, exerting further supreme power of regularization consisting of making live and letting die. Agamben's co concept corroborates. We can see that the, no the non-status of the non-being population allows for colonial structures and administration to establish a legal civil war 
that allows for the physical elimination of entire categories of citizens who for some reason cannot be integrated into the political system. These ideas of total domination and violation of ethical bodily integrity resound through Fanon's concept of the zone of non-being, whereby absolutely any action, regardless of how dehumanising it might be, can be levied against the colonised purely because power dynamics supporting white domination reinforce and legitimate it. To recall how Sartre described the absurdity of suicide as a negation of the capacity to, of the individual to contribute to the ideal world, Sartre failed to consider that in the dichotomy of life versus death, it may be that life has already negated the capacity of the individual to contribute. Let's remember how Achebe describes the discovery of a common death. A man who was once revered, celebrated, admired and feared was reduced to a body, nothing more than his corporeal form by both the colonizers and the assimilated, conforming cost by the assimilated conforming colonized population. In truth, what Achebe sought to show was that it was not the suicidal act that resulted in Okonkwo's decline and fall, but rather that he was reduced to the status of non-being through the progressive colonial domination of his community and culture. Therefore, we should not look at the first question posed and ask, why kill yourself? as this question presupposes that all individuals have equal ethical and human rights and observe a universal value system. We live in a world where, one, individuals were and continue to be routinely tortured and sexually humiliated with no access to justice and no criminalisation of perpetrators. Two, many women are subjected to female genital mutilation legitimated against them by the cultural value systems governing the beliefs of their wider community. 3. The population of certain territories are indoctrinated into legitimating and reinforcing the repressive and violent total domination of their authorities, even where in innocents may die as a result. 4. Certain communities are subjected to a cycle of vilification in media for rejecting war-torn lands and appealing to power elites to merely be recognised as fellow humans. And five, individuals belonging to certain racial or cultural groups are treated drastically differently to other groups by law enforcement authorities with power dynamics legitimating this enforced difference. The individuals on this non-exhaustive list live in relative zones of non-being, where they are refused bodily, in refused bodily ethical and intellectual integrity. They are treated as subhuman in many regards, even if it is just that they are not treated in the same way as other members of their communities or other populations belonging to different races, genders or cultures are treated. Therefore, looking at any hypothetical iteration of suicide among these populations through a lens of justification and rationality is reductionist, as it affords normative status to these populations one that is not afforded to them by their own social, cultural or political situation. It is impossible to say that for every human the same question of justification for suicide can be applied. For Fanon, applying the question of justification to dominated and dehumanised populations is a fallacy, and for Achebe, attempting to justify a conquest suicide is futile. Justification presupposes ethical relations, which is, it is clear did not present themselves to the colonised people. Therefore, suicide cannot be treated as perpetually unjustifiable. To do so disregards the environment that the individual finds themselves within and reduces suicide to an abstract methodology through which death can be achieved. In reality, suicide is often seen as an, as an escape or a transition to an alternate existence. The individual would rather exist in the afterlife, whatever that may be, or not exist at all, than continue to exist in reality. Their existence is a zone of non-being, in Fanon's word, and therefore existing in the obscurity of death is viewed as a realistic alternative. Consequently, for investigating suicide, we must ask why a specific individual in their specific circumstances killed themselves. Following the legacies, legacies of Achebe and Fanon, we have to move away from trying to justify the suicidal act in the framework of universal humanity. 
and adopt an approach which prioritizes the socio-cultural, economic, political and ethical environment of the individual, fundamentally looking at whether the individual is recognized and treated as a human being or a non-being. That's it. <laughs>